Welcome, welcome. Thank you. It's good to have you at USC. Glad to be here. Thank you very much. Oh man, those names. Yeah, Pretty the names good. are not coming. I didn't think that through. He, Brandon goes, that's a terrible idea. It's a <laughs> yeah. terrible idea. Right. We all make mistakes. It's a one semester class, right? It is. It is. But some people take it multiple times. They Got just it. don't register. But um, it's people like you. Show up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, what That's happens awesome. is like, you're like, hey, we, we, we need your assignment. You are like, yeah, I'm not in this class. I, never, I just sit in here every week. Happens all the time because people like you. That's Thanks awesome. Thanks for being here. Yeah, is your first time here. at USC? No, I've been here a few times. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But not. Um, mostly? Mostly actually for like community service staff on Saturdays. So okay. maybe not officially with the school. But well, yeah. Welcome to the entrepreneur program at SC. Can you give us an overview of sort of where, we'll, we'll start with Blavity and we'll just, then we'll go back and just sort of about your background. Sure. And then we'll come back to Blavity. But just give us an overview of, of where Blavity is today in terms of people, coverage, content, business model. Yeah, so um, Blavity is located right down the street, downtown uh, LA. We have 75 full-time employees, an office here and an office in Atlanta. Um, we have five brands, as you saw in the video. So we range from your traditional news publication um, online, and we also have conferences. So Afrotech, which is the largest black tech conference um, in the country, which is in San Francisco, and now moving to Oakland. Um, we have Summit 21, which is a women's conference, and Travel Noir, which is a brand that we acquired, which is the largest black travel brand, um, and Shadow and Act, which focuses on Hollywood and diversity. So um, we've been around for about four and a half years. I started it um, when I was working at Intuit at the time and living in San Francisco. I started my career actually in Mountain View. How many of you guys have been to Mountain View before? Yeah, so like 22 in Mountain View is not the thing to do. It's not that fun at all. Um, and so I moved to San Francisco at the time, and um, we'll, we'll get into that later. Um, started the, the company with three of my friends from undergrad. I went to Wash U. Um, and yeah, it's been, it's been a fun ride. So raised a little bit under $10 million in three years. Um, one of very few black women and, and black folks in general to raise a series a, um, particularly from an institutional investor. So, you know, that's been, been an interesting journey and yeah, we are just getting started. Good for you. Congratulations. All right. We'll circle back to that. You mentioned that, uh, you went to Wash U. Let's go even before that. Where did you grow up? Tell us a little bit about your family, brothers and sisters, what your parents did for work or do for work. Yeah, so my, my parents were high school sweethearts, um, which is super cute. Clearly, that's not me. Um, so, yeah. Um, and they're from St. Louis. I'm from St. Louis, actually. So I'm like one of the rare people that went to WashU that's actually from St. Louis. And um, I have a brother who is an orthopedic surgeon, uh, Stanford, you know, medical school, and he's two years older than me, so he lives in the Bay, and yeah, that's it. It's just us, us four. We're kind of like the Cosby family, um, like minus the bad shit, but like you know, <laughs> but like the Cos like the TV that's show right. for real. Yeah. Um, and my dad's a sickle cell disease doctor, um, hematologist, oncologist, pediatrician. So, um, you know, I grew up around, uh, and he's raised in, in his world, he's raised a lot of money because he's a research, researcher, right? So he writes tons of grants. And so it was funny when I raised my first million, he was like, oh, that's nice because he had no concept because he's raised a hundred million dollar, you know, research grants are huge. And I was like, wow, okay. Bar is really high, really high. <laughs> yes. And uh, what were some of the, you know, a couple lessons that you, you take uh, from your parents in terms of what they instilled in you? You know, um, so my parents, I didn't really know how good of a parents I had until like probably in the last three to four years. I think I took them for granted. Um, they taught me a lot about hard work. I mean, my dad used to drive me to school every day because I lived in the county, but I went to school in the city in middle school. Um, and so he was on conference calls all the time. He was always working, which I never knew anything different. Um, but now looking back, you know, I, I know a lot about like hemoglobin SS and all these blood diseases and all these things. And, um, it's really abnormal, like how I grew up in terms of my parents really instilling this desire to like learn and constantly asking questions. The second thing that I, they taught me was um, a lot about personal finance. So I started investing when I was around 13 in the stock market. Um, and the the way that they set it up was if, if, I, if my grandma gave me like a hundred dollar check every year as grandmas do, right? They're just like a hundred dollars, just even to this day, I'm like, great, thanks, you know, um, and which actually now is like still a lot of money, but they'd say, hey, you can spend the money on whatever you want, but if you put $50 in your bank account, we'll match it, right, and uh, I was like, well, 
great. Like, that's obvious. I should definitely do that. Um, and my brother, on the other hand, were quite different, never did it. And now, you know, our bank accounts look quite different. But, um, <laughs> and really to the point where anytime I wanted to put money in my investment account, they would match it. So in my mind, I'm like, that's 100% return, right? I was like smart enough when I was 13, I was like, done. Yeah, great. Thanks, mom. So I got a job. So then I started to put the money for my job into uh, my investment account and they had to match it because that was the deal that they set up with me to the point where I then I got two jobs because I had no expenses, <laughs> right? So then they started to give me expenses like, well, now you have to pay for your cell phone bill. And I was like, okay, we can do that. Um, that lasted till I was around 16 when they were officially like, okay, you know, she gets it. You know, she's, she's definitely been taught um, to be to invest in and to to hustle and uh, I even hustled them quite a bit so yeah you know you can tell somebody if they've got those lessons a couple of these lessons you don't worry about them anymore and that's I, I have to admit like I didn't have that type of guidance and I didn't have that type of um, of that teaching of you're 20 years old now just the value of compounding your money mm -hmm. at five six seven percent over you know she said how far ahead she is of her brother and that's ten years Imagine 50, 60, 70 years. It's going to triple, or I'm sorry, it's going to double every 7.2 years. And so just the value of compounding your money. You work so hard to make money. And if you can have it work for you over time. So it's good. Huge. I bought Facebook when it was at $18. You know, Apple, I can't even remember, maybe like 100 this is, They've split since then, maybe like $100. So from now, I mean, I didn't have that much money. So it was like maybe $2,000 when I first started. But now, yeah, it's like, hey. This is pretty good, and I've never taken any out. Yeah, and when you see how hard it is to make that, you know, starting a company from scratch and right. maybe not taking a salary at market value, all those things, it just yeah. it really helps. And uh, you mentioned side hustle. You uh, early early signs of being an entrepreneur? Oh, I was a right? hustler. I was hustling everybody. I have loan documents that I gave to my brother where he was like, he wanted to buy Grand Theft Auto, and my parents wouldn't buy it for him. I was like, ah, sure, no problem. That's like, what, 50 bucks? done 50 bucks give me back 75 in like two weeks and then he stopped paying me and so then I went to my parents and was like hey like my brother Malcolm owes me some money and so then they just gave me his allowance directly so um yeah I definitely was a hustler and crazy interest rates <laughs> yeah. um another example in middle school in, in St. Louis they were working on reducing um you know sugar in schools so they took out different things candy in the vending machines so I went to Sam's and I bought a bunch of candy and I would sell it at school because why not supply demand exactly um, so the, the legal term for the first <laughs> deal that she said with her brother is called what usury <laughs> <laughs> that's called usury you're, you're limited to certain interest rates usually most but uh, within families and then uh, how she enforced it was a remedy or security by securing it through his it's, it's brilliant you do that today uh, grab a piece of security or collateral. <laughs> Collateralized <laughs> loans at eight years old. Pretty impressive. You mentioned where you went to, to school at Wash U. Uh, what would you study? Um, I didn't go to class much. So I studied political science. Don't do as I say. Um, but you guys are all here. So I studied political science and um, also entrepreneurship and, and education. Um, I was student body president as a sophomore. So I was the youngest student body president at Wash U. And I was freshman class president the year before that. So I spent most of my time um, hanging out with my friends and allocating money. Um, and a lot of those people now are, are you know, great friends and, and actually my co-founders. Excellent. So while you're there, is, is sort of the, the idea from uh, for, um, for Blavity sort of hatched? And think about, tell us about sort of how it originated. Um, maybe if there were any events happening that sort of led to that as well? Yeah, so um, Blavity stands for Black Gravity, and I went to WashU, which is very similar to USC, probably a little bit less diverse, um, but you know, predominantly a white institution, um, or a PWI as we call it. And so, but there's this moment every day at the lunch table, we had a, we only had one um, kind of large dining area. And so there's this all rectangle tables and it, one huge round table in the middle. And of course, that's where all the black people sat every day. So we were super loud, really obnoxious, having a great time. We would talk about everything from what the Greeks did last night to, you know, critical race theory to like economics or finishing your homework that is due in five minutes or do you even go here anymore like didn't you graduate the whole thing right so we needed to I mean for for me it was um 
it was definitely a place every day where I could feel at home. And I didn't feel like I had to be the student body president that day, or I didn't have to be in, in class and you know answer the questions. Um, it was it was a place of comfort. And one of the things that was really important, I think, in college for our community was that everybody was discovering their blackness at a different pace. You know, some people had only ever been around black people all, their whole lives because they were from the south side of Chicago, and so Washu was a huge culture shock for them. Vice versa, some people were you know from Andover and went to Exeter and. This this was the first time that they had ever been around more than two black people in their whole life, right? And so there are people who are second generation, you know, immigrants from Nigeria. So um, it was definitely a moment, I think, where people could explore and they felt safe and they were challenged. And when we graduated, we lost that in a lot of ways, like moving to different parts of the country. Um, you know, I moved to Mountain View. My co-founder, Jeff, who's our CTO, was at Palantir. Aaron, our COO, was at Bain in New York. And then Jonathan, um, our chief brand officer, was in at LinkedIn in San Francisco. So we're all over the place. Um, and we felt like hey, this sense of loneliness actually is universal um, for many communities, not even just black folks, really. And how do we how do we recreate that feeling of belonging, that challenge, um, that information sharing from entertainment to serious like news? And actually, that was really my news table, really. Um, and how do we distribute that and, and duplicate it online? So that was the inspiration for Blavity. Um, and that's also where the name came from. But you didn't launch right from school. You went and got no, a job. No, not at all. So let's yeah. talk about what what most people will do. Some people will launch. Some people will go to grad school. Some people will will go and get uh, some experience. Uh, talk about that transition in your life. Why you decided uh, uh, to take a job and where you, where you went and worked. Yeah. So um, I thought I took the LSAT uh, my junior year. I my parents wanted me to be a doctor, and I was like, I'm not doing that. Um, so then I was like, I'll be a healthcare management person. I'll run the hospital. No problem. Business, health. I get it. Done. Then I got into, uh, I went to a health care management class in, in the business school and was like, this is super boring. I don't want to do this. Um, so then I decided I was going to change the world by being a teacher. I went through a whole lot of chameleon situation. So I was like, I'm going to be a teacher. Um, and I got into the, the school districts in um, the city of St. Louis, which was really interesting because the best schools and were really the best the best teachers, the best principals were heavily regulated by, by the state in federal laws, um, very much teaching to the test at, at that time. And so it was, became clear that politics and people in power were making a huge impact on communities when they didn't actually really understand um, the variables that that made it made good outcomes. So then I said I'd be a politician. So that's when it started, really. And I was like, I'll be a politician. So I ran for student body president, and I got on the board of trustees. Um, and then I realized there, I promise I'll get to the point then. So I realized there that being on the board of trustees, you know, who's on the board of trustees? It's people who donate a ton of money, right? It's people who maybe didn't necessarily go to your school, or maybe they have a, one student that one of their children go there. Um, but they are making decisions about the city because they're deciding what buildings you're going to buy. Um, they're making decisions about what your campus life looks like, what your required courses are, tons of decisions. Um, and then it became apparent, okay, um, being a politician is tough. That's actually not what it is. It's, you need power and you need influence. Um, and what's the quickest way for me um, and my community for us to have power and influence? And technology was the fastest way to get there because uh, I really believe the internet is, is the ultimate way to democratize access to information and access to information and being open-minded um, and knowing what you don't know and, and finding that out as fast as possible is really how you grow. Um, and so I said, okay, Silicon Valley. Um, what does that look like? How do I get there? And I, I started working at a startup, which was probably one of two startups in all of St. Louis at the time, and uh, worked there for two years, my junior and senior year. And the, the guy who started it, the, uh, his name was Joe Wagner. Um, he was like, go to Singapore. That's the fastest growing you know, economy. And I said, N I'm definitely not moving to Singapore. Black girl not Singapore. That's not going to work for me. Um, but I started applying to different companies of tools that I used. So at the time, I had just filed my taxes. And I was like, well, who does TurboTax, right? And Mint.com was hitting me up talking about, you're over your budget. I was like, who does Mint? And turns out this company named Intuit does. So um, I you know, got the interview, flew out. They had free snacks. They had dogs, palm trees. I was like, I'm in. 
you know. <laughs> so I got, I got the job offer like freshman or the first semester senior year and from there um, was chilling in, in all the senior year until graduation and, and then just went straight to the Bay. And what did you do at Intuit? Um, I was a product manager, which I knew nothing about. Tell us what a product manager. <laughs> tell us what a product manager does. Yeah, so a product manager is um, really the advocate for the user, and so they are the ones who is listening to customer feedback, um, filing tickets, and making sure that you are designing the product in a way that. Um, is going to deliver the the customer consumer requirements. So for for me at the time, I was working on a payroll product that was helping small businesses file their um, payroll taxes. And the insight at the time was that a lot of payroll folks are actually doing things manually still with spreadsheets. Um, and But they didn't want a huge, overly complicated solution that a lot of things that, that Intuit had was very, very complicated. Um, so we had to think about what features and requirements were, were going to meet their, their needs. And uh, what did you like about working at, in, not necessarily into it, but that job? And what did you take away and learn from it about yourself and about whether that was the right fit for you? Well, I loved Silicon Valley. Um, I love the idea of um, how do you create products that millions and millions of people can use. And building things at scale was something that was really interesting to me. Um, the idea and kind of the innovation cycle of idea, test, pivot retest, look at it, track, et cetera, et cetera, keeps going, right? That was awesome. Um, what I didn't like was when I came home at 445, there was nothing to do because I was in Mountain View. Um, so I felt that sense of loneliness. And, and so I had to figure out, okay, well, how do I, how am I fulfilled in my day job, um, but not fulfilled in, in my personal life and kind of my weekends? And is this something that I want to continue to have this feeling for another 5, 10, 15 years if I continue to be in, in a large tech company? Um, and the answer was no. So I had to think of some alternative life choices. So it sounds pretty deliberate. And that's, I think it's accelerating between the time when I, 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 when I decided I was a lawyer and practiced law for five years and then sort of launched something at 29, 30. And I think it's shorter for them in terms of like the, the maybe not, the time period that they want to like pay their dues mm -hmm. and work at a company. What you decided then this is the time to launch. Uh, so I want you right. to go through that decision. The course is called Taking the Leap. So I want yes. you to talk about that decision. So I stayed it into it for three and a half years. And really, I stayed it into it for about five years. So I'll tell you about that in a second. So year one, I was like, this is great. I'm learning everything. I was a sponge. I was like, I'm studying everything. I'm reading every Quora thread, like everything. Paul Graham, Y Combinator. Like I'm reading anything tech. TechCrunch, everything, Pando Daily, all this stuff. Um, and then I was like, okay, great. Like, I got it. I get it, right? So then year two, I started to get antsy. I moved to D.C. and I actually, um, I was in a, like a rotational program, which a lot of them have. Um, so I moved to D.C. to help with lobbying and work with their lobbying group and help them um, learn a little bit about the business in D.C. Did that for six months, so that kept me interested. Um realized that DC is not the place for me. They moved too slow. So moved back to San Francisco to a company that Intuit had acquired called Demand Force. And so I worked at Demand Force as one of the first Intuit employees at Demand Force when they were working on the integration. And so that was really interesting because they were a very traditional startup. They had maybe raised a Series B at the time, maybe around 300 people, um, downtown San Francisco, beer pong, free food every day. It was like the whole thing, very much of a sales floor. Um, and I was in business development at that point. So I had seen enough of the industry. I had seen enough options like, okay, well, if you, maybe if you don't want to be a product manager for the next five to 10 years, maybe you can work on you know, the regulatory side. Oh, that's not right. Okay, maybe you should go work at a smaller company. I got, got exposed to what a smaller startup would look like because of, of working at Demand Force. Um, and then, so, so that was really helpful for me. Also at the time, um, I had moved into San Francisco, which is quite different than living in the Bay, kind of in you know Palo Alto, Mountain View world. Um, much more interesting in terms of lots of startups, um, lots of people doing things. And really, I saw other people and I was like, that doesn't sound good. Like, why did you, how did you get a million dollars for that? And it's like, I could do better than that, right? So there's also this sense of competition that happens when you're in Silicon Valley, really in San Francisco specifically, and I'm sure it's similar here on campus where you guys see other people and you're like, I could do better than that. Um, and the answer is you can, right? You just have to take the leap. Like you actually just have to do it. So that was the first kind of realization for me was that 
this isn't special. They're, these folks that are here are just people. The people that we're reading about on TechCrunch and all this stuff, they're just human. And like, it's all in your mind. You have to just move. You have to just go. So I made the decision um, to... I made the decision to quit my job and then it took me about six months to save up the amount of money that I needed to save to feel comfortable quitting my job living in downtown San Francisco. So I saved up um, enough money for about a year and a half to keep my apartment. Um, And I ate boiled eggs and oatmeal for a very long time to make sure that I could do that. You know, it's, you can tell she's a planner and she knows how to manage money. Some of you guys will have a gig, you know, that will, keep you paid until you're ready to launch and you have enough money if, if you don't have sort of outside support and uh, savings. Um, and it's really important to have that peace of mind that like I have a long enough runway to give this a go. And so uh, tell us about the origins. I mean, you told us about the origins in school, but right. you made the decision. Tell us about your, your, your team sounds it's a great pretty team. experienced. You know, yeah. you named the, the places that everyone worked. Um, it's no surprise that you can raise a lot of money because all those people are from great places. Mm-hmm. Uh, so who'd you pull together and then just, uh, you know, when you first took the leap and then, you know, the thing that everybody has to to think about is uh, telling your parents you're leaving a high paying job <laughs> for the startup world. Oh, yeah, that, we'll get to that later. But, um, yeah, I think so first um, a couple of things. So so Jeff, our CTO, was at Palantir. Um, he is a rock star coder database guy. And the first insight was like, OK, when you are building a company, you need to build something that you're passionate about. And it should be something that you are willing to be broke for like five to 10 years doing and broke very, very publicly because you can't really build things in private. You have to build loudly because that's how you get traction. Um, So I had to be really comfortable with failure and everyone knowing that I was failing. And once I got over that, then it was, okay, well then what do we want to do? And Blavity, um, I'm actually very agnostic about what Blavity looks like over time. So when we started, I didn't want to be a media company because media is really, really hard. You guys have seen the news. You've seen Mike, you know, go out of business. BuzzFeed is having a tough time. Vice is having a tough time. Friday 29. Everybody is having a tough time. Um, And I knew that that was the odds were against me in a lot of ways in the media industry. And also fundraising for a media company is also very difficult because the multiples aren't very high. Um, So I was like, I'm not going to do a media company. We're going to be a platform. We're going to build uh, a tool that allows for black folks to connect with each other and share stories. Black people in general are amazing content creators. The funniest stuff on Instagram, the funniest stuff on Twitter is typically coming. Vine, Periscope, like all really popped off because of black people, right? So then I don't really need to make content. I need to just distribute it and be a place and a hub for discovering things. So that was the original, um, that was original goal. And how many of you guys have heard of World Star? Okay, yeah. So we're going to be the Sophista Ratchet World Star. That was the goal, right? So, um, so we tried that. And so we spent maybe about three to four months building the first version of the product, uh, which was really, really ugly. And then nobody liked it. So I said, okay, well. Um, Let's build a newsletter. So I scraped all my friends' email addresses, which is illegal now. Don't do it. Um, And I started sending them emails, driving them to these different videos that we had curated. And then we would track what they clicked and then start to create more content. We'll actually distribute, curate more content from the things that they were clicking. From there, uh, it became apparent like what people were interested in, and so we started to do content marketing. So I created a blog over a weekend, just WordPress, and um, it was blog.blavity.com backslash blog. Like It was a ridiculous URL, and we had tracking on everything, and the blog was, was actually doing much, much better than the videos themselves. People were more interested in the stories behind the content, the content creators, um, than the videos. And I, I'm a numbers person. So I was like, okay, you guys want written content? That's so much cheaper than video content. No problem. So I hired a bunch of bloggers, and that was the beginning of Blavity as the world knows it today. So that process from launching in July you know, 2014 was all the way up into January of 2015. By January 2015, we were over a million monthly unique visitors in that process, but it took it really only happened over four or five weeks <coughs> towards the end. It was very, very slow in the beginning. So that's that's not even five years ago uh, when you've launched. And um, 
when did you sort of feel like, wow, we've got, you, you've got traction of a million uh, uniques a month, which is not easy to do. And what was your business model originally? Uh, originally, we, f we didn't focus on, raise on revenue. Um, we spent the first year really building the brand and making sure that we had content that people liked. Year two, we did say, okay, we need to make money. Um, if, if I'm going to ever raise money, I, I need to disprove this, this theory that people have that people won't spend advertising on kind of black content and black, the black consumer. So we make money today in a few different ways. I'll tell you about how I made a first, my first dollar as well. So today we make money on display advertising. That's bread and butter for all digital media. Um, we make money on event sponsorships. So anything with enterprise, so event sponsorships, branded content, video content, um, we'll do, we'll live tweet TV shows and get deals from that. Then the last one is consumer revenue, so ticket sales, right? So our conferences do millions of dollars in ticket sales. Um, that's something that's incredibly important to have a diversified kind of revenue stream because particularly in media where things can fluctuate depending on the Facebook's algorithm, things can fluctuate depending on just the market um, and, and enterprise spend. So it's been important for us to have those three different options. Are you producing events or are you yes isn't that a heavy lift yes a lot of work yes it is a lot of work <laughs> it's understatement you know it's tomorrow you have one exactly. yeah <laughs> nine months and then it's gone in 24 hours exactly all the deposits all the coordination the flights all yeah. the things we uh we include it as a gift with tuition we don't charge any money but they just have to pay tuition <laughs> <laughs> just kidding <laughs> um okay so um Telling the family that your this thing has got legs, it's oh, real. Miserable. Really? Oh, I cried so much. I would just go home. My parents live in Nashville now because uh, my dad moved to Vanderbilt. Um, and, you know, they also, they and in the first place, they didn't understand what I was doing with tech in general. So the idea that I could be making basically six figures at 23 years old with no advanced degree, like building things on the internet was just like you should stay there like that's already a fluke you should stay <laughs> like why would you quit right um so that was the first thing they really didn't want me to quit because they felt like I was just going to be in the big city and just I don't know I don't know what they thought I was really doing um then we started to get a little traction but it wasn't their world right our audience is is average age is 24 so it's not like their friends would share blavity articles and they could be like that's my daughter right it wasn't until even when i raised my first round so my first round of funding was like 500,000 even then they were kind of like oh okay that's nice um I would go home for Thanksgiving or Christmas and I would sit at the dinner table and my dad would still tell me that I could go do a post back and so that I could go to med school. Like this was after I'd already raised. He was still saying, maybe you should go and take science, go back to college and take science classes. <laughs> like dad, it's done. Like I'm over it, you know? Um, so it was really, really tough. And, and they're, they're my biggest fans for sure. And, and they definitely raised me in a way that they didn't want me to have to take these types of risks. Um, and I think, you know, the, the really the moment that it clicked for them, how big it was, um, was when they, I had them come to Afrotech, our tech conference. And it is one of the most phenomenal things you'll ever see. I mean, it's this year, it'll be between 8,000 and 10,000 people, um, all VCs, founders, you know, people in the music industry. It's, it's a fantastic experience. And they went and they were like, aha. I see, I see the people, I can see the energy, like this is, this is a big deal. Um, definitely, I don't even think raising my Series A really, they could really like understand the impact of that, but yeah. Well, when, is that, when is Afrotech? And where Afrotech's is it, in November. Where is it? Like? In Oakland. Oh, Oakland, okay. Mm -hmm. And um, were there any things happening in the world that either solidified your plans, accelerated your plans? in the news? Yeah, so I'm from St. Louis. Mike Brown happened in August. So we launched in July. Mike Brown happened in August. And, you know, being from St. Louis, but still being in San Francisco at the time, sitting in my cubicle, because I hadn't quit my job yet, um, it was really obvious the disconnect between black media and black media was very antiquated at the time. So there were publications, because Mike Brown happened on Saturday night and Saturday day. Um, 
there were publications that didn't tweet about it till Monday because they didn't have any staff working on the weekend. And like the thought that as a news publication that you don't have a 24 hour news cycle, um, particularly when in a moment where there's had already been enough you know, kind of turmoil where you knew you needed to be watching, uh, was really disappointing to me. And then the second thing that happened was the like Vice and a lot of other kind of millennial media brands went and sensationalized it in a lot of different ways about the fires and the riots. And they didn't actually talk about the issues. And you could see the discrepancy because being from there, I could see, I knew a lot of people that were on the ground. Um, and I could see the, the news stories that would pop up on Facebook and on Twitter and the disconnect. So that's when um, I definitely quit, you know, within 45 days of Mike Brown happening, I just quit. Were, were you looking at it as solving a, 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 a problem, filling a void in the market where there wasn't news, or was this just what your passion was? Like, you know, most, most entrepreneurs are solving a problem. Right. So what were you, what was your mindset there? So the problem that I was solving, um, looking back, and it really still is the case today, is that the black consumer is incredibly underserved with all types of products all over the place, whether you're talking about consumer, physical goods, you're talking about, you know, entertainment, television, movies, that's why movies like Black Panther and others are so successful, um, music, not really, I think we're fine there, sports, we're fine there, right, so there's some industries where we're fine, right, um, so I, again, I'm, I was agnostic about it being a media company, but I knew that we had a, a highly engaged consumer that I was passionate about, um, one that was also over-indexed on being an early adopter of technology. I mean, when you, who is riding limes and bikes? I, go, I was in Atlanta last week. It's all black boys running around Atlanta on, on limes, right? Like we are early adopters of technology. We have a, a higher risk tolerance um, and a greater need. So that's the perfect storm for something like Blavity. The fact that we don't have a social network that is run and owned by people of color is actually, I think, a market inefficiency in the long run. Excellent. And um, I read an interview, and I, I wanted to bring this point up. Um, what was the biggest obstacle in, in launching and getting Blavity off the ground? Not necessarily a business issue, but maybe internal. Well, now I don't know. What did I say? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Great research. Yes. Uh, uh, mindset mentality. Oh, or, yeah, definitely and, mindset. Now, talk yeah. about that, because as a, as a young person, you know, people are always going to tell you you don't have enough money, you don't have enough experience. Sure. Go do these things. You don't have access. You don't really know what you're doing yet. Yeah. So those things are back there, and I, I want you know, as a 23, 24 year old launching a company, right? Share that. Yeah. So um, I did a lot of research. You know, I, I was I'm a planner, so I I read all the blogs. I read every everything you could possibly read, um, and. There was no one that looked like me that was black. I'm not even just starting with a woman. But let's just start with black. There was no one at the time who uh, had raised over a million dollars. Um, the only person who was in the news at the time was Tristan Walker because he was head of BD at Foursquare. Like that was like the biggest thing. And uh, obviously Tristan went and sold his company to P&G, which is great. So we made it. But at the time, that, that wasn't there, right? Um, so that was the first thing. There was no clear example. And so that was, that was one. And then the second was that as a woman, and you go and you look at a lot of women who are successful and women of color, they all have advanced degrees. They all have a law degree, um, an accounting degree, some sort of advanced degree. And I had nothing. I had a BA. Not nothing. Shout out to the BA. I had a BA. <laughs> and... Um, and and I also didn't go to Stanford. I didn't go to MIT. I didn't go to any traditional schools that were that were for fundraising or um, being in Silicon Valley. So there was certainly um, this as a planner. There's certainly this mindset of, well, how? Why do you think you can do this? Like, why do you think that you can be successful? That you can defy the odds when everything that that you've looked at shows you otherwise, and. Then when you talk to people, even the people who love you the most, the people who believe in you the most, your parents, your friends, they're like, that's great, but are you sure, right? Um, that was something that I had to be really comfortable with with myself. And the, the 
ultimately the framework that I often use when I'm trying to understand kind of what I need to do next and what Blavin needs to do next is this idea of if I in 10 years from now will look back at me at this moment, if I can project the future and look back, will I be happy with my choices? Will I regret that I did not take that leap? Will I regret that I did not work harder or try bigger or aim higher? And if the answer is yes, that I can I can look at my future self and say, oops, you would have been disappointed in yourself, then don't make the decision. Like focus on the now and focus on the present, what you can control and, and just move forward. In life, you're probably going to regret the things you don't do uh, rather than the things you try. And even if you fail or get a setback, right. um, how do you, you know, you're doing things that have, haven't been done and certainly they haven't been done in your life. Uh, how do you sort of train yourself on you know, being outside of your comfort zone constantly mm -hmm. and being, you know, an area of uncertainty and ambiguity. You're running a company yeah. and you're 29, 28, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so how do you sort of help train your mind on that? Uh, I have a lot of discipline. So I have a lot of routines that I do to make sure that I'm my best self. I'm also surrounded by an amazing group of people. Um, so I make sure that, and, and I'm very transparent. So if I'm having a bad day, I will actually say, I'm having a bad day. So that everyone around me knows so that they do not think that my behavior is a reflection of their actions. What I've learned is that a lot of um, being a strong entrepreneur and being a leader is about self-management. It's very much what Gary said, right? It's about mindset and managing yourself and being self-aware. And then really being able to communicate your self-awareness and your emotions and your decisions to other people so that they have um, clarity of thought and they're not guessing because that's a waste of energy. So everything from my calendar, anyone in my company can see every single thing on my calendar. It says, wake up, work out, like walk to work, drive from Burbank to downtown LA, um, rest, eat, literally every single thing they can see on it because then they're not wondering, where is she? What is she doing? Can I meet with her? Yes. You can clearly see where I am. And then also making sure that I'm, I am then following that schedule um, has been really helpful for me to just like stay grounded. I also do plan quite far out in advance. So I know what we're doing. Or I know the options of things that we're doing in 2020. And when I set that goal, I then work backwards. So let's say, for example, that in 2020, um, I want Blavity to make $100 million. Well, then what do we need to do in 2019 to make sure that we're going to hit <laughs> that goal? If we're not actually, if our actions and our behaviors are not aligned with our future, goal, then clearly it's not going to happen. So we constantly, and I'm constantly looking at, well, where am I trying to be and working backwards from there? Excellent. Um, I'm going to give them a chance to ask some questions in a few minutes. We talked about funding and sort of being in, in a all too small group of, of, uh, uh, of women and African American women who've raised, you know, over a million bucks. Can you talk about that experience, um, uh, positive negatives and lessons learned for them when they go to raise money? Yeah. Um, the first thing is I failed trying to raise my first round of funding. I think it's important that people know that because a lot of times you hear the successes and you see the, the funding announcement, but the media, running my own media company, I know this, it's not actually real. Like the stories that people tell are not real. So they'll, someone will say, so-and-so raised a $10 million Series A, but what you won't know is that that was actually five convertible notes that were bundled together, that they sold you know, 40% of their company to get there. You don't actually know the deal terms behind that raise, that headline. So one is, um, for me, was I didn't actually understand the game of fundraising. I didn't understand the storytelling and the momentum and the network that, that it requires. So when I first raised, I, I went out to all your traditional brand names, right? brand name VCs. And as a media company that was pre-revenue, there was no way that I was going to be successful. Um, the second thing I did was I went to the black venture capitalists because I said, they're going to get it. They understand what I'm doing. They understand the market. They have the same pain point. They're going to invest. What I didn't understand was their economics. I didn't understand what they were um, solving for and the positions that they were within their own venture funds, what they had started their own, or they were a, a GP or a managing partner at another fund. So they had different requirements. So then when both of those groups said no, I was like, well, darn. It's like, if neither one of you are going to invest in me, then clearly I need to build a business that doesn't require venture funding. And that's when I really made the decision to go after revenue instead of huge user growth in the early days. We're just now in our large scale moment. We've spent a lot of time building up our sales team, building out our revenue. 
the when I was successful at raising, which is it only I moved very fast. It was only about six weeks time period in between those two. Um, but in startup land, like that's a lot when you're racing against a, a clock, which is your bank account. Um, and I then went to social impact investors. So my first money came from people who were mission aligned with Blavity, where if Blavity succeeded and only became a $200 million company, everybody was happy because us existing helped them meet their mission. For a lot of venture capitalists, $100 million or $200 million exit is not sufficient. Like that's, that's not good enough. And so they won't invest. And I didn't realize that at the time when I was talking to certain types of investors. Um, one of the, the craziest things, and this is very true in the Bay, is that when you're hot, you're hot. So, you know, every single round has been oversubscribed since then. You know, I've, I've pushed money away frequently at this point, um, which is a shame because there's so many people who need money that aren't getting it. And a lot of the, we're a safe bet at this point. We've been proven. Um, we have a clear roadmap. And, and so, yeah, that, that's definitely a, a problem I, I see in the industry in general. But if you took more money, you'd be diluting yourself even more. And so it's good to know how much you need. It, 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 it's both sides. If you take too much money, there's a definite downside. But if you don't take enough, there's also the desperation of, you know, you're yeah. always raising money and you're not focused on the business. So tell us about your, your sort of your role now and how you divide your time. Not yes, today. not as structured as you just described. <laughs> um, Primary role of a CEO. Primary role of me as a CEO, public facing, um, definitely there's a difference between being a founder and a CEO, right? So being a CEO, um, it's my responsibility to be a representative of the company. So I woke up this morning in Oakland for Afrotech. I had to go around all of Oakland, the city, the tourism board, the BART, the airport, all the powers that be. And you say, we're doing this thing. It's great to meet you. I'm Morgan. We're having a bunch of people come into your city, right? So I have to, I have to do a lot of, uh, I call it kissing the rings. I do a lot of kissing the ring, especially as a young entrepreneur where with a quite large audience at this point, um, it's an interesting dynamic because I'm, I'm not exactly what people expect. Um, so I spend a lot of time in meetings. And then on the operating side, I'm responsible for all of our brands. So every single brand reports into me. Um, all of our events report into me. Marketing of course, investor relations. I had breakfast with one of our investors this morning. Um, yeah, a lot of things. So my COO does our revenue. Um, I also still do finance. I really have too many jobs. I need to hire more people. <laughs> you, hear, you hear that? That's always we good do have internships. Deal. Yes, we do. How about school? Do you have a mic ready to go for the students? Questions for Morgan? Hi, thank you for coming. My name's Emily. Um, I was wondering, working in media, how you navigate through like the noise of social media, and um, I loved how you talked about just always wanting to learn and um, acquire knowledge on different topics. How do you navigate through the noise of social media, and do you have time to read books, and where do you kind of spend your time and focus? So that's a great question. So um, I, on the personal level, I'm on Instagram all the time. So I really focus on one platform because I think everything, it's too overwhelming to do too many things. So my Instagram is, is really where I show people what I'm doing every day, my little business tips, um, sitting with a face mask, like everything. And in terms of books, yeah, I, I read all the time. So I just read Subscribed. Um, about, you know, the future of subscriptions. Um, I read, you know, Good to Great. I've read Habits of Achievement, like literally so many books, and I Instagram all of them. So, yeah, um, I, I have a constant relationship with, with information and Instagram and, and Twitter as well. I'm pretty big on Twitter, but I don't tweet that much, which is kind of weird. Yeah, um, I don't Facebook. I don't Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, hi, um, thank you for coming. Um, I just wanted to ask, since you schedule all your entire schedule and like share it to like your entire company, I was wondering how you're able to like segment it off so that you don't really like get bored of the same doing the same thing. It's pretty impossible to be bored doing what I do. I'm invited to so many really cool things like this, um, dinners, parties, screenings galas, all the things. So um, yeah, my schedule is never the same. Um, when I'm in LA, I try to maintain a routine, but I'm, I'm travel three out of basically four weeks um, in a month.
you. Hi there, my name's Kristen. Thank you for coming and speaking tonight. I was curious as somebody who, you know, your life is basically focused on human connection and, and building community through people. How can we increase the compassion and human connection and decrease, you know, the hate that's out there in the world, especially online? That's a great question. I think telling real stories and like showing people um, the humanity, the shared humanity that we all have um, through emotion, whether that's happiness, joy, pride, um, loneliness, and, and people being open and vulnerable. Um, I think there's actually never been a greater time for that really to be possible because there are no barriers to distributing content and stories. You know, you can post on Medium and go viral. You can post on Instagram and go viral. Um, and I think that the challenge is that everyone else has also gotten quite loud, right? And so it's on us to um, pay attention to the stories that matter and that you connect with because that's how the algorithms work. If you linger on the Kardashians, you're going to get the Kardashians. If you linger on Trump, you're going to get Trump, right? So you have to actually monitor yourself and your behavior because that's what the systems will reward. Hi, I'm Ben. Thanks for coming. So I know you said that in college, you were very involved with student government or the president, which is very impressive. And then you also said that you didn't really go to class that much, which I found kind of interesting because there are a lot of really successful entrepreneurs that never really went to class and honestly, same, um, except for this one, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very practical. But I was wondering, and you kind of talked about this framework a little bit, if you flash forward to the future where the most successful entrepreneurs rave about the classes that they went to and they all were amazing students that were always in class and then you work backwards what are the kind of quantum leaps that you think education system needs to make uh to get there well sorry I, if that's a loaded question no that's a great <laughs> question um you're making me think i like it um I think that education is kind of funky right now. So I think there's going to be different types of schools, right? So I, I think that classes like this are very practical because we're really having a discussion, right? We're giving context. It's open-minded. You guys can interact. You can follow up with me on Instagram, Twitter, whatever. I'll DM you back. Like, it's done, right? We're all friends. This is very practical. Other classes where you just sit there and they give you a textbook that they probably wrote and you're just like what is this? Like, I read this. So why are we talking about it? I just read it. So we need to have conversations. We need to have dialogue. That's the stuff that's going to go away because you, you don't, um, or we'll just be online. So I think classrooms will be about bringing people together and having conversations and, and, and then other people being able to listen in real time and digest. Um, yeah, that's what I think. Uh, hi, I'm Dev. Thank you for being here. Uh, so I wanted to focus on the, when you said that you, when you just had launched the first version of Blavity and you said that, you know, you realized it wasn't going to what you wanted to, so you pivoted, um, and then getting the first users, um, what was that process like for getting the first users? And then, um, what was that point when the floodgates opened and you got like the million <laughs> unique visitors? Right. So the first users I stole cause I scraped my friends' emails when they don't BCC, I said, yes. So I took all of them. And then from there, it was people sharing. So we didn't spend money on Facebook ads until year two and a half. So we everything was organic. Um, and Facebook, this was also around the time where it was really easy to grow on Facebook because just how Facebook was working, right? This was when BuzzFeed was really first doing well. Um, Upworthy was a thing, right? Like all that time. So you could really grow organically through your friends sharing. Um, and, and that was to our benefit. The The reason why people shared our content was that we, we would write stories that other people literally there, it didn't exist. So we had such unique content. And to this day, if you go on Blavity, you're going to find 50% of stuff you've never even heard of, these new stories. Um, and that's really what gives us our edge is, is that we are in um, – we are really in the community on a day-to-day -day basis. 30% of our content is user-generated to this day. So people are sending in ideas, stories, essays, um, and that makes sure that, that our, our organic reach is also continuing to grow. Hi, my name's Nate. And going back to what you said about your schedule and how it's visible to everyone, 
I feel like if I did that, I would be terrified about people coming to me in personal time and like never being able to lock down the like friends and family and, and stuff like that. Um, so I was curious if there are any systems or like maybe you have a personal assistant who helps you defend some blocks of time and, and if so, like how you hired that person. I have an assistant. His name is Dimitri. What's up, boo? Um, it's his second week, though. <laughs> um, but I've had I've had assistants oh. before. Yeah, he's a pro. He's yeah, high over experience. Um, so actually, what I've found is when you're transparent with people, they respect you more. So when it says rest, they don't bother me. When it says eat, people are like, "Aren't you supposed to be eating?" And I'm like, yes, thank you for the reminder. So uh, I really think that uh, having a mindset of abundance and not scarcity and like transparency really helps other people function around you. You actually can control your time more when you say, I only take calls in the morning. And when your calendar says book calls with me, people like book the calls where you tell them to or they try their best to actually. So that has allowed me to have more control um, over how I want to live my life. And I encourage my teammates to do so as well. Um, where now we kind of have this weird habit in the company and certain teams where everybody's like synced, right? It's like after a certain time, nobody talks to each other. After a certain time, everybody's meeting together um, because that's that's the flow that, that works best for us. Good question. One last question. There we go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So The question, the viral question. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, my name is Justin. Thank you for coming. Uh, throughout the, your talk, there was like an underlying theme of family being very important to you. And I know you say how hectic your schedule is and how your family's kind of spread out now. So I was just wondering, how do you still find time to get together as a family? Is that something you struggled with initially? Have you, How have you coped with that? Yeah. And uh, yeah. Um, so that's a great question. I think that it's something that I definitely was, I was a bad sister and a bad daughter for the first two and a half years of Blavity. And, and I think for my mom, I'm probably still a bad daughter because I don't call her enough, but, um, you have to make sacrifices in the beginning. And sometimes that means the people's closest to you. Um, it's not for everybody. And I have spent a lot of time now that I have more resources and have more people around me to help with Blavity, um, hanging out with the people that matter most um and yeah like you lose a lot of people along the way so I'm not going to give you a cozy answer um it is a sacrifice and it is a choice and a lot of people you know put you on their back particularly the, the folks who are closest to you because you keep, they're the only ones you can be vulnerable with right you have to be weak at times and that's when you're with your parents or when your boyfriend or your girlfriend or whoever it is at the time um and yeah that's that's definitely a challenge i think now i invite them everywhere so like my parents come to afrotech my parents come to summit 21 my brother comes to afrotech you know they'll come to la they'll stay at, they'll come to the office my mom's done videos with the team so i try to incorporate people into my life now but it was very difficult in the beginning I think it's a, it's a good question. It's important to, you know, so many people come up here and, you know, we bring out pretty successful people, you know, and we all aspire to sort of pick up some habits and tips. But let's be honest. I mean, being an entrepreneur is hard. Very difficult, yes. And then you're smiling and you look like all put together, but like, it, and you are, but like, I want you to be honest, like how hard it is. Balance is very difficult to come by, particularly until you have someone you can lean on and assign things to. So. You know, were there points in Blavity where you were just like, I'm not sure, or like, or yeah. is it worth it? Because, it, hey, getting a check every two weeks, there's benefits to Ooh that. Ooh-wee, I wish. <laughs> I mean, I do get it now, and I'm like, thanks, me. Shout out to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> seriously, it's a weird feeling when you get like a salary that you paid for. Um, did you sign the check? Well, no, it's automated yeah. through Gusto. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... It is like, congratulations, you got paid today. <laughs> um, it is really hard and it is very lonely and it is specifically lonely to be the CEO because there are things that you don't want to put on your co-founders because you need your co-founders to focus on their jobs. So you need them to do what they're doing really, really well or you won't make it, which means that you can't even talk to them about some of the stuff that's going on um, because you need them to stay focused. And if they're distracted, then you may fail. And... 
you know, there were definitely times where our bank account hit E and the team didn't know. And I had to just walk in the office and smile and wire money from my personal account into the business account and just be like, I'm glad that you guys paid rent this week. Like that was my money. Right. And you, you have to, uh, you have to fake it a lot because the, um, the potential risk of people freaking out is actually more damaging to the business. So as a CEO, there's, there's so many times where you make choices to carry things on your own shoulders or in your own heart. And that can be quite difficult. Um, so yeah, it does happen. Yeah. Cause when you talk about all that transparency and saying you have a bad day, uh, and, and I respect that. I do think people do respect transparency and, and, uh, uh, authenticity. Sometimes, as you said, you don't, you know you can't let your sales force know that things are bad or that you're having it because if you pass that along to people, especially in a small company, it can you know morale can go downhill quickly, mm -hmm. and that that can be one of the benefits of having a partner. Because um, some people like to be solo entrepreneurs, but some people, when you have a partner, a true partner that you can close the door and just say, "This is really, really messed shady. up," or "This is yeah. tough," or "I don't want to do this right now. I need your help on this. I need to take a break." for a week or whatever it is, two days, and I need you to just take over. So the benefits of having a partner. Um, yeah, and you know, the guys that I started the company with, we've now known each other for 10 years. You know, they've seen me in sweatpants and a top bun going to class every day. And they've seen me, and I've seen, you know, them get married and have babies, right? So it's um, starting a business with your friends is difficult, but also can be quite rewarding because of the trust levels that you have with each other. Um, and you know that, you know, you're going to live a long life as entrepreneurs. And so this is just part of your journey. And we want to make sure that everybody is happy and makes it through. That's great advice. I want to be respectful of her of her hard time, but I want you guys to give it a chance to uh, to meet her. So let's give a, a warm thank you to Morgan Devon. Thank, thank you for you. having me.